right, so our, our speaker today is uh, joining us by Zoom, obviously. Um, hopefully that's not a surprise at this point. Uh, uh, we are so grateful that Larissa was willing to change her, her mode of presentation last minute and join us uh, via Zoom. I will uh, read her introduction here. Uh, she studied political science um, at, uh, at Rutgers University and got a minor in Hungarian, which is a combination that I have not yet had in the, in the speaker series. She went on to get an advanced degree in organizational leadership from Penn State. Uh, she's had a fascinating <laughs> career. Um, she worked for the Secretary of Agriculture in Pennsylvania, then went on to um, work for the governor, Tom Ridge, as a public policy expert. Uh, she then took her expertise overseas uh, she was a personal advisor and head of business development to a member of the royal family uh, in the United Arab Emirates. She then served as head of the royal family's non, uh, nonprofit foundation, Circle of Hope. And um, that organization focuses on, on women, youth literacy, and education. And in that capacity, she uh, visited and served in refugee camps in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, Larissa Miller is currently CEO of Phoenix Global, which is a, a global boutique consulting and business development firm. She has received many, many recognitions. She's been named uh, as the, um, the 10 most influential business leaders of 2021 by Excelion Magazine top 100 people in finance by the top 100 magazine, uh, 100 gl uh, global women of excellence by Sovereign magazine, top 10 most influential friends of Africa by For Business in Africa magazine, 2020 personality of the year by Powerhouse Global magazine. Uh, other than that, she's flown under the radar very effectively. Uh, we are very lucky to have us with today, Larissa Miller. Thank you, everyone. Um, I can apparently fly under the radar, but I can't fly into Cedar City because Delta had other plans for me. My suitcase, however, is there. Uh, and thank thankfully, technology allows us to be able to come together while staying apart. Um, you all there studying entrepreneurship are getting a, a phenomenal foundation in the basis of entrepreneurship and the mechanics of entrepreneurship. I'm sure you're learning about P&Ls and business plans and, and pro formas, but the mindset and thought process of an entrepreneur, the thing that will distinguish you from all of your competitors as you step into business is something that you have to develop in yourself. To know that you have to develop it, to have the seeds planted, to give you the potential of rethinking your approach to business is something that you have to cultivate. And today, I hope to at least be able to help you prepare the soil for those seeds. Tyler, can I share my screen? Please do. Okay. I didn't know if I was able to, but I will certainly. Um, let me... <clears throat> So I am for sure an unconventional entrepreneur. Um, I never set out necessarily to be an entrepreneur, although I've had this mindset since I was a child. I learned in high school that I was good at calligraphy and I found that you know, if I did things like address envelopes for people, I could get money to be able to go out with my friends for the weekends. And, and so that was really where my entrepreneurial seeds have started. Um, I grew up on a farm in central Pennsylvania and had a father that would wake me up every day at 6 a.m. and say, the day is a quarter over. What do you have to show for it? So from a young age, I've, I've always had that, that get up and get started mindset. And that's really what's going to be the foundation of distinguishing um, you as an entrepreneur. But I am Larissa Miller. I am CEO of Phoenix Global, which is a global consulting firm. We consult with governments, municipalities, and businesses around the world on their strategies, helping them redevelop, redesign and redevelop their business models. We consult around transportation, technology, 
uh, my personal passion, which is agriculture, because there won't be an investment in any industry or sector that will make sense if we can't feed ourselves. Um, I am also president and CEO of a company, Keystone Farm Future. And um, through a very crazy idea I had a few years ago, we are disrupting the beef industry in Pennsylvania with a model that I believe will reshape the beef industry uh, nationwide, which that's a, a really, and I'll talk more about that today, but that's really exciting and a bit scary because the beef industry is, is one of the most, um, let's say, I'll say corrupt because it is, but it's owned by four major packers that have, have really controlled the industry and made it very difficult for our family farmers to, um, you know, to stay in business and have an economical way forward. So I'll touch on that a little bit uh, later as well. Um, I am COO of the Bridge Eco Village with former NFL player Gary Gilliam. Um, Gary, uh, is more known for his time with the Seattle Seahawks and probably in the 2014 NFC championship game when on a fake field goal, he scored a touchdown to put Seattle back on the scoreboard and ultimately took them back to the Super Bowl for a second time. Um, I sit on many nonprofits. I'm on the board of directors for Odafe Owe, who is an outside linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, he has a nonprofit that looks at promoting entrepreneurship on the continent of Africa, preparing youth through seed capital and through knowledge and resources to be able to change their lives essentially by capturing a space for themselves in the entrepreneurial market space. So entrepreneurship has been the foundation of humankind all the way from the beginning before we even had a currency. Um, back in the days when we, we, simply, we simply traded. And um, it's the basis of all business enterprise. And for sure, it's the, the foundational rock, the keystone, if you will, of capitalism. And um, as we move forward in this very disruptive business environment, the large multinational is not going to be the owners of the business space anymore. It is going to belong to the entrepreneur, the small and medium-sized enterprises as they are the ones that have the flexibility, the innovation, and the strategy necessary to be able to pivot and innovate much more rapidly than the large enterprises can. So what is an entrepreneur? The standard definition, the, the Webster's Dictionary definition of an entrepreneur is a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses taking on greater than normal financial risks in order to do so, okay? That's, that's the standard definition that we all know um, that we've come to love. And I'll tell you, that's a, that's a definition that we're going to disrupt today. Because if you follow this traditional definition, it's going to keep you right in the middle of the pack with all of your competitors. Um, and now it's not letting me advance my slides. There we go. What is an entrepreneurial vanguard? It's what I hope each and every one of you will be. It's a group of people leading the way in new developments or ideas. It's the disruptors. You don't simply want to be an entrepreneur. You want to be a vanguard of the way forward. You want to be the one walking ahead of all your competitors, forging the path that they will have to follow. You don't want to be in the middle of the road with all of your competitors. You want to be cutting new pathways and looking for new directions to go. Because my friends, I will tell you this in the middle of the road is where you get killed. So as we approach today's talk, um, as we get to know one another, and hopefully as we, we um, connect and stay in touch for, for a long time to come, I want you to think of yourself as an entrepreneurial vanguard. So there are, there are four points to remember um, as you step into your role as an entrepreneur and a business founder. You know, if you do things in a way nobody else is doing them, you will have opportunities that no one else has. So that's how I managed to become the first American to be integrated uh, to the royal family in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. It's a space where no American has ever been before and for sure no woman has ever been before. Um, through an offhanded conversation with someone that I didn't even realize was a member of the royal family, um, they started asking me questions and, and posing some, some interesting situations and scenarios. And I've trained my mind to think out of the box enough that I very quickly could come up with some solutions 
that they hadn't heard before. And still not knowing that it was a member of the royal family, you know, we, we exchanged contact information and, and broke apart. And about a week later, I get a call living in Abu Dhabi that I was to go to the palace. And um, that's a bit scary because, you know, as an American expat, I didn't know if I had said something, did something where, you know, why I was being singled out. But I went to the palace and lo and behold, there was the woman that I met in that coffee shop who turned out to be one of the top sheikhs, who is, which is the equivalent of a princess in Abu Dhabi. And she asked me to run one of her companies, which became two of them, which became three of them, which then became one for her brother Muhammad, one for her brother Zayed, and then ultimately for her father. All because I deploy strategies of out of the box thinking, I disrupt legacy business models, and I look at every single situation and scenario as an opportunity to snap that jigsaw puzzle apart and reassemble it in a way that creates a brand new picture. Don't get comfortable with your success. Um, never get comfortable with your success because success is fleeting. Unless you're always staying on the cusp of what's new, innovating, disrupting, um, pivoting, which is a word that I hate because it's become so overused during COVID. Unless you are always looking for ways to differentiate yourself, you know, if you get comfortable with your success, if you are, are in a legacy business model where you think, you know, I've got it all figured out, we own a great space, we have a great deal of customers, we're good right where we are, ask Kodak and Blockbuster what happened to them when they got comfortable with their success and failed to look at how to innovate and move forward. Kodak who? Um, Always remember that nothing is as vulnerable as entrenched success. One of my favorite quotes, entrenched success is where you get run over. Entrenched success is a business that's here today and gone tomorrow. What that means is that if you aren't looking for a way to be different tomorrow, if you aren't looking for a way to be different than every single one of your competitors, you run the risk of being irrelevant tomorrow. And most importantly, don't just be a founder of business. You must be a founder of change. We have done a horrible job of preparing the future for you people sitting in that room today. So we have a responsibility to prepare you for the future. And that means shaping you to be the founders of disruption and change that will create a new and sustainable tomorrow. I have six pillars for entrepreneurial success. And while they may seem very sophomoric and, and commonsensical, you know, they're often the first things that people forget when they actually step into the role of a founder and their business is rolling and the challenges are coming and the competitors are circling and their customers are here one day and, and, and maybe not so, so present the next. And you have to find ways to, to keep your business rolling. You forget some of the most fundamental platforms and pillars that will turn you into a successful entrepreneur. The first one is to learn. Life never stops teaching. You should never stop learning. And I'll expand on all of these a little bit later. Second is make a decision. Goals depend on decisions. And this is the number one most important attribute of an entrepreneur, of a business person, as someone who's successful in life. And it's the one thing that is most difficult for people to do. Have courage. Fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. You know, when your mind starts telling you you can't do it and you start being afraid of, of what's coming or the unknown or what will happen if you try, I can only tell you that if you don't make the decision to try, you will never have the opportunity to even explore what potential lies in front of you. Take action. Potential means nothing without action. You can be the most intelligent. You can be the most talented. You can be the person that has the most, um, the most, um, with the largest amount of potential, you could be voted as the one in your high school class that is going to change the world. But unless you take action, all the potential in the world means absolutely nothing. Disrupt and innovate. Life is too short to waste time building what everyone else is building. You want to start a business? You have competitors that you can compare yourself to. You can see how they're doing it. You build your business off of that and you try to capture the same space that everyone else is doing. And that's fundamentally where most small businesses fall into a rut and why 80 
I think it's 85% of small businesses are you know, considered failures within the first five years of operation, if not sooner. So while you may be in a space that is occupied by so many other people, right from the, the starting block, you have to find a way to distinguish yourself and do something that no one else is doing. So learning, to go back over these points that I just showed you, learning develops potential. Potential depends on you taking action. Action requires the ability for you to be able to make a decision and that decision requires courage. Courage is the antivenom to regret and disruption depends on all of the above. This little table right here, at any point when you get stuck on any one of those elements, if you just reread these points, it will help you push past the struggles that you have because it shows you how everything is circular. Everything is secular. It all connects back to each other. Learning develops potential. Potential depends on you taking action. Action requires the ability for you to make a decision and that decision requires courage. Courage is the anti-venom to regret. You don't wanna wind up 80 years old looking back and saying, I wish I had done this when I was 30 or 40 or 50. Where would my life be? And disruption depends on all of the above. And the most, one of the most important pillars then to wrap up those six pillars, which we'll then expand on a little further is the give back. A business is only as strong as the community it supports. And what COVID has shown us is that our business community is no longer in the proximity where we live. Our business community is global. Your brain contains the most valuable real estate that you own. What are you going to build there? You need to pay attention. You need to watch everything that's happening around you. It's a learning process. Learning goes beyond conventional education. For the rest of your life, you're going to have to constantly reskill and upskill. I mean, look at my generation. We grew up before the computer. We hand wrote our papers for college largely. Um, I was at you know, in the early 90s, when I was at Rutgers, I got one of the very first laptops. It was a compact laptop. It weighed about 20 pounds. It had a word processing tool called WordPerfect on it. Um, I had to listen to the AOL dial up even to be able to get on this thing called the internet, which was very limited in the capacity of what it could deliver me. We didn't have the ability to um, gain knowledge at our fingertips. This is another important point. We, when we want to learn something, we Google something. We don't put a lot of time into committing that to our permanent memory. On, when there are important things that you need to carry with you, don't trust Google to give you that knowledge. Be able to turn to your own mind. So use that real estate in your head to store the most invaluable points that you're gonna need to reflect back on as you become an entrepreneur. When you listen and learn, you find solutions. You develop the ability to reimagine unique ways forward. This will set you apart from the pack and, and make you stand out from all the competitors circling around you. This will allow you to disrupt. Your competitors are most likely not disrupting. They're trying to stay current in their space. They know what their business model is. They know how everybody else is doing it. And they're only trying to do it as well or better than, than the restaurant up the street or the store around the corner or the tech company that's just spout, sprouted up on the street behind them. Everyone is just trying to stay within that space. They're not looking at how they can set themselves apart. And that is what's going to differentiate you from all of your competitors. That's what's going to turn you from the corner store into an Amazon. Learning allows you to think with a global mindset and business will now forevermore be global. When you look for your customers, when you look for your supply chain, when you look for collaborators, and when you look to gain knowledge, you're going to have to look around the world. Someone around the world has already figured out what it is that you need to figure out. Someone around the world has already put in place the seeds of whatever it is that will allow you to disrupt yourself from the competitors in your local community marketplace. You have to always stay engaged. Watch what's going on in your business space. Read as much as you can. Look for the fractures in your industry that no one else is filling and figure out how to fill them. And you may say, okay, well, that's really a difficult thing to do. That's like trying to find the next great invention that's going to turn me into a trillionaire. 
And I can tell you that it, it is easy and it is something that each and every one of you can do because everyone is bogged down in just keeping their legacy business model alive. They're not taking the time to actually dissect their business model, see where there's fractures, see where there's opportunities and find ways to do it differently from everyone else. Knowledge allows you to differentiate yourself in that crowded market space and it will always keep you fresh and relevant. Knowledge never goes stale and knowledge is always something that you have to keep current. Nobody can do that except you. Those who get complacent, those who get entrenched in their business models, as I mentioned before, are the ones that think they've learned everything they need to know to make their business successful. And this world is moving at such a rapid, progressive pace. It's transforming, it's disrupting itself at such a pace that if you don't stay on the forefront of knowledge, learning, and also be the one putting knowledge out there for others, you will find yourself struggling like Kodak did. Learn from the bad examples of the past to set a good example from the future. Learn from those who have exhi exhi exhibited bravery under duress, kindness during times of hate and courage during crisis, and learn from those who had strength when their, when their tribe was weak. These are attributes of leaders that you will find from George Washington through you know, General Eisenhower through Ronald Reagan and beyond, every single great leader had these particular attributes that they knew that they could call on and count on during a time of crisis, a time of duress, or even a time of peace and calm. You always have to make sure that you are staying kind, that you are brave, that you are patient, and that you are strong because your tribe is gonna depend on you to be the one that, that has the strength when everyone else is weak. Learn to silence the out outside noise. There are always going to pe be people who will prophesy your failure. There are always gonna be people that say, why do you wanna do that? Or why are you doing it that way? Or why are you even doing it in the first place? You have to learn to regard those as just white noises in, in the background and silence them. You control that little voice up in your head, that one that gets in your way a lot of times, but that's also the voice that can tell you, don't listen to them, you can do this. You already have it planned out in your head. It's going to work. Take those steps and do it and ignore everybody else. There's always gonna be people that will prophesy your failure. And when I struggle with this part, when I start to let those people get into my head, when I start to let that white noise affect me, I think back to yet another thing that my father gave me as a child, and that was this poem that he used to recite to me when I was a child. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so he'll, so, so he'll, till he tried. Then he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face, and if he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one else has done it. And people, plenty of people will say that to you. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat. And the first thing we knew, he'd begun it with a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin. And without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done. And he did it. There are thousands to tell you it can't be done. There are thousands to prophecy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you but just buckle in with a bit of a grin, take off your coat and go to it. Just start in to sing and tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. And that is why we have Google and that is why we have Amazon and that is why we have Unilever and that is why we have, we have um, Philip Morris. That is why, you know, good or bad, that is why we have the large multinational companies that exist around the world because they didn't let the white noise get in their head. They kept plugging away. And before you knew it, they'd done it. Decidophobia. Yep, it's a thing. I didn't know that until recently, but yes, decidophobia is a thing. It is the fear of making a decision. So many people are afraid to make a decision. They're afraid they'll make the wrong decision. They're afraid somebody will will call them on their decision. They will ask their parents, they will ask their friends, they will ask their neighbors, they will ask somebody walking down the street, what do you think I should do in this situation, in this scenario? And all that does is muddy the waters of clarity when you ask everyone's opinion. Find yourself one or two confidants, one or two people whom you trust, You know, run the points through them, get their perspective, but at the end of the day, 
you have to be the one to make the decision. With each juncture in life, you will need to make a decision. Be strong in your convictions, even if those convictions are, are contrary to public opinion. And don't be afraid to swim against the current. The ability to make a decision is the single most important attribute of a successful entrepreneur. And this is why so many businesses fail because the leader gets bogged down and cannot make a decision to stop, to move forward, to move left, to move right, to innovate, to go backwards, whatever it is, the ability to make a decision is the most important attribute of an entrepreneur. A leader is someone who has the ability and the courage to make a decision. And this is not always the CEO. A lot of times you'll find a company that has a CEO that needs to ask everyone's opinion first before they'll make a decision. You know, you'll be an employee in a company and you'll say, I wish they would just decide which way we're going already. So a leader in that organization is the one that has the ability to influence the decision or make the decision. And that is not always the CEO. That can even be a junior level executive. When you distinguish yourself as an ability, as the person who has the ability to be resolute in your decisions, trusting in yourself, not doubting yourself because you are the one person with whom you can have complete trust. Sometimes a decision leads you to make a mistake, but mistakes are as much a part of life as successes, and they often teach you the largest most and most important lessons. Don't be afraid to fail. Not making a decision because you're afraid to fail is worse than making the decision and failing because failure is one of the necessary stepping stones of life and following your endeavors through to the end. You know, sometimes that end is bitter and sometimes it's sweet, but each conclusion you reach will leave you stronger than you were at inception. Not every decision is a good decision and that's okay. You can always forgive yourself and start fresh with the sunrise. Don't look backwards. Don't stumble on what's behind you. Always keep your eyes in front of you. The mistake of yesterday leads you to the opportunity of tomorrow. Every decision has an impact and every decision can be remedied. Goes along with the point that I just made. Whether it's a good decision, whether it's a bad decision, whether it was a neutral decision, nothing good or bad happened. Every decision can be remedied. You can always change your mind. You can always fix it, but you can't act on, you can't take action on something that you didn't decide to move on in the first place. Don't sit at tables or decide not to sit at tables where you will be the topic when you get up. Those aren't your tribe. Those aren't the people that have your back. Those aren't the people that's gonna, that are gonna help you to fix something when, when something didn't go as planned and those aren't gonna pe be the people to be grinding with you through the early days of entrepreneurship when you know paychecks aren't that regular, when you're not really sure what's the right way forward. You want your tribe to be loyal to you. You want to be loyal to your tribe. And those are the people that won't be talking about you when you get up and leave the room. Decide to collaborate. Collaboration is, the, is number 17 on the sustainable development goals. Collaborating for the goals. It's one of the most important elements that we have as young business people is our ability to collaborate. Even competitive collaboration. We're afraid of competitive collaboration because we don't want someone to steal our IP. We don't want someone, someone to steal our customers. You know, we don't want someone to steal our innovations and ideas. And that is fundamentally the wrong thinking. If you collaborate, if you competitively collaborate, you're stronger together. Your network grows, your customer base grows, your knowledge base grows, your ability to claim a larger share of your market space grows. Competitive collaboration is very important, and it's definitely something for you to research and learn about and learn how you can bring the spirit of competitive collaboration stronger together into your business model. Decide to be a rule breaker, change maker, glass ceiling breaker. Women, stick together, support one another. Don't sabotage one another. Men, be welcoming of the ideas and innovations that women have regard their, their presence on your board or in your office space as something that can add value and know that together you have the potential to be unstoppable. If it's us against each other, we can't be the solution together. Important decisions to make. 
Decide not to sit at tables where you will be the topic when you get up. I just said that. That's a really important one. Who you pick to put around you, the people you hire into your company, the mentors that you choose, the friends you choose, and those who will support you on your entrepreneurial journey are your tribe. And you want to make sure that you're loyal to them and that they are loyal to you. Decide to always look forward. Do not stumble on something behind you. There is a reason the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror. There's only so much you can do with what's behind you, but the whole world is in front of you. If you're looking forward, you're going to see opportunities. You're going to be seeing a different finish line than all of your competitors who are looking sideways and behind them at all of their competitors, trying to figure out where they're doing, what they're doing, you know, where their customers are. How do I get their customers? If you get bogged down in that nightmare, you're never going to succeed. So always be looking forward. Always be looking at your own way forward. Don't be watching what others are doing and know that you can't stumble on something that's behind you if you're looking forward. Decide to always go the extra mile and remember there's no speed limit on the extra mile. You know, if your competitors are going here, you go one step beyond them. If they've built a widget, try to build that widget better. If they have good customer service, have great customer service. If they have a business plan that is competitive in, in this market space, you make sure you have a business plan that's competitive for the future. Always go the extra mile. Always go a little further. Always do it with a bigger smile. And remember, there's no speed limit on the extra mile. It may take you 10 years to find a way to get ahead of everybody else. But those 10 years, no matter how slow you're moving forward, the point is you're moving forward. And that's exactly what you want to do. Don't ever stall. Always take another step. If you have a failure, if you have a setback, oftentimes that's tempting for us to say, I quit. This is just isn't working for me. Or I need a break. I need to regroup. You know, it's when you stop that you never get a chance to restart in many times. As long as you, even with your failures or your setbacks or your limitations or your mistakes, as long as you decide, okay, I did it, it's behind me. Tomorrow, I'm gonna take one little step forward. That keeps you moving forward. And before you know it, you'll be well ahead of everybody else. Don't let your history control your destiny. A lot of people say, well, I never got a college degree or you know, I spent time in prison or, you know, I never have business experience because I was a stay at home mom for 30 years. Don't let your history control your destiny. If you see a dream, if you see something you want to work to work towards it, don't look backwards, look forwards. Courage is the anti-venom to regret. A very, very good point to remember. You know, when you're 60 or 70 or 80 or even 40, you don't want to look back and say, I wish I would have tried to do something. You know, as John Acuff said, be brave enough to suck at something new. If you don't start, if you don't try, you'll never know if you had the opportunity to change someone's life, build a company like Amazon, or be that new disruptor that can reshape an entire industry. Let your purpose trump your fears. Every single one of you in that room has a purpose. Some of you will find your purpose. Some of you will come to the end of your life never knowing what your purpose is, wondering what, it, what in the world you were supposed to do with yourself. It's right there in front of you. Sometimes you just need to sit down and reflect a little bit. Where are your interests? Where are your passions? What disgusts you about humankind? You know, what problems do you, do you see in the world that you think you can contrive a solution for? Your purpose is right there in front of you. You just need to take some time to sit back, reflect, and think about it. Put down your cell phone. Destiny, solutions, and success. Destiny, solutions, and success will be invisible to those who are too busy taking selfies. Pay attention. We are afraid of what we don't understand. This goes back to my first point, always keep learning. This is why we have so many conflicts in the world and why people distrust one another and why we have hate crimes because we're afraid of what we don't understand. And that translates into we hate what we don't understand. If we learn, if we form empathy and perspective and we have a respect for different countries and cultures and ethnicities and ways of thinking, 
then we put ourselves above everyone else that's that's back there in the conflict. We are the ones that rise above and will lead the way for the future and ultimately be the role models that future generations will follow. So always learn the things that you don't understand, the things that you hate, learn about them and you may just very well change your mind. Have the courage to make a decision, safe in the comfort that if you make a mess of today, forgive yourself and start with the sunrise. As I said earlier, the ability to make a decision is one of the most important attributes that you can have, but it takes courage to make a decision. Having cur have courage to adjust your route. Relish the unexpected detours that life bestows. These detours will lead you to unimagined experiences, destinations, and people that are often missed by those who are too inflexible, fearful, or distracted to see these diversions as opportunities. Follow your dreams, but don't be afraid to change those dreams. As you grow and evolve, so will your hopes, goals, and aspirations. Life is unpredictable and ever-changing, and be brave enough to change with it. As Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one most adaptable to change, but change takes courage. Don't be afraid to embrace that change. The ones who are crazy enough to believe they can change the world are the ones who do and you're sitting in that room, every single one of you has the ability to be someone who changes the world. Take risks. To quote William Shedd, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what a ship was built for. Greatness doesn't come from comfort zones. Dream big, work hard, and don't give up. As an entrepreneur, you may have to try a thousand keys before you find the one that opens the door, but if you quit, that door will stay shut forever. Take action. Achievable benchmarks are the key to sustained action. Where we fail as entrepreneurs is we set the grandest goal that we want to achieve in our life. And then the first time we hit a speed bump or a roadblock or we hit a wall, we say, well, I gave it my best shot. I just don't think that I can do this. I'm going to try and do something else. And we quit. If you set achievable benchmarks on your journey as an entrepreneur, if we set the grandest goal we want for ourselves, but we set measurable, we set, we set measurable benchmarks along the way. And as we achieve those benchmarks, we see success and that's what keeps us motivated to keep going on. If you are a contractor and your dream is someday to build a housing development that has a thousand homes in it, and in a year or two years, you haven't built a single home or you've only built two or three homes, you're likely to quit. If you set that goal to build a 5,000 home development, and then you set benchmarks that, well, within six months, I'm going to have my first plan approved by the city. By a year, I just want to build one home. By three years, I'm going to build five homes. By five years, I'll have 20 homes. As you hit those benchmarks, realistic benchmarks, that will keep you motivated and that will keep you on the pathway to success. And before you know it, you will have a housing development that has 5,000 homes and you will have a second one with 5,000 homes because you keep yourself, you reward yourself for success and you keep yourself moving forward and something that shows you that you can do that. If you set the, if you set that big goal and it's really lofty, you know, I want to have a fortune 500 company by the time I'm 30 and it doesn't go so well by the time you're 27 or you only have five employees by the time you're 28, you're going to say, it's just not impossible. That was a foolish dream of a young person. I have to get realistic and this is what I'm going to do. Then you know what? You're never going to be that fortune 500 company because you're going to settle for those failures. You're going to make those failures. You're going to make those limitations you're going to make that the, the benchmark that you have for your business. Whereas if you say, I'm going to have a Fortune 500 company, this is the strategy that I'm going to use to get there. These are the benchmarks that I'm going to force myself to target and use as measures of my success. Before you know it, you'll be there. So take your business plan, break it down into achievable benchmarks, and you'll be well on your way to succeeding at that big goal that you set for yourself. If you try and you fail, congratulations, because most people won't even try. This goes back to make a decision. Have courage. Most people will never make the decision to try because they don't have the courage to try. 
So if you try and you fail, congratulations, and then use that failure as a way for you to retool your thinking. Okay, it didn't work this way. I'm still marching towards that big goal that I have for myself, but I'm going to try and figure out a different way to approach this, or let's have a different strategy, or let's use a different innovation in order to be able to get to that goal. If you fail, just use that as the catalyst to retool your thinking. Don't use that as the reason you quit. Ideas without action remain ideas and ideas remain ideas unless you have the team to execute them. And your team is not always your employees. As a young startup, you may not have the resources, the capital, the profits to be able to have employees yet. So your team may be your parents. It may be your friends. Um, it may be uh, a, an entrepreneurial incubator that you participate in or a club that you're part of online or a club that you're part of at school. That is your team. That, those are the people that are going to help you to figure out how to execute on your ideas, turn it into action, and ultimately lead you to business success. You will never build a successful business if you only build it in your mind. Take action one step at a time, but it's important that you take that step. Every day, take a little step forward towards your ultimate dream. Take a step forward towards those achievable benchmarks. If you don't move forward, you're never going to see success, at least not in the business space that you are, are desiring to be in. You know, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. It ended because of progress. And progress implies forward momentum. And the only way you can progress, the only way your business pro can progress, and the only way you can ultimately become one of those entrepreneurial vanguards is if you take steps forward. And know this, you can't control anyone's thoughts or actions except your own. You know, there's going to be people that tell you that you can't do it. There's going to be people that, that get in their own heads. In some of the groups that you're in, there's going to be somebody that says, oh, I had a great idea. Somebody stole my idea because I see a business out there online. I'm going to quit and find something else to do. That is toxic thinking. That's what's going to keep you from achieving your full, the full measure of your potential and ultimately achieving the success that you're destined for. Disruption rarely comes from within an industry. It almost always comes from outside. You know, think of things that, that weren't around 10 years ago. So let's think Bitcoin, Instagram, um, selfie sticks. God, how did we live without selfie sticks? Siri. Influencers didn't exist 10 years ago. Meal delivery kits didn't exist 10 years ago. Airbnb and Uber didn't exist 10 years ago. And I will tell you that Airbnb and Uber were not created from within the industry. The hotel industry didn't come up with this wonderful concept of Airbnb and the taxi industry sure as heck didn't come up with Uber. So disruption rarely comes from within the industry and every industry has infinite room for disruption and you can be that disruptor. I'll explain to you how I did it with the beef industry shortly. When you find a way to disrupt, think through every angle, examine every link in the chain and find a way to strengthen each. This is what I did when I looked at how do I take a model like the beef industry in an industry that I'm so passionate about, which is agriculture, having grown up on a farm, coming from the state of Pennsylvania, which is a large agricultural state, um, and more importantly, Lancaster County, which is the largest non-irrigated agricultural county in the United States. It's where the Amish and the Mennonites are, where they still drive horse and buggies. But they're almost all dairy farmers and our dairy industry is so badly fractured right now that we're losing family farms at a record rate. With food security being our number one global concern, we can't afford to lose any farms or else we're not gonna be able to feed ourselves. So what to do? So I looked at what can I do that could help dairy farmers to be able to stay in operation? Okay, well, let's see if we transition them to the beef industry, how does that work? Well, okay, we can do that, but I'm competing against the, the four big meat packers. So Larissa, how are you going to create a model that's gonna allow farmers to stay in operation? And I put my thinking cap on and I sat down and I disrupted the way the industry works. And I thought the answer is right in front of me. In agriculture, we have a grow and hope model where we plant our seeds, 
raise our livestock and we hope we get a good price when, when we take it to sell. And to me, that's a broken model. So I thought, what if we start by securing the offtake? What if I know exactly what a supermarket wants to buy for meat on their shelves and I build a herd around that? And even more, what if, the, what if I make it so that the supermarket can own their own herd and they can control their own supply chain and they can have surety of supply on their shelves no matter what hits? And that's what we did. I started talking to supermarkets and I pitched the idea and I said, hey, you want to make sure you have meat on the shelves. This is a great model. And oh, by the way, it's going to allow our family farms to stay in operation because now they don't have to own the livestock that they're raising. They can be paid to raise your livestock that is putting meat on your shelves. And lo and behold, this model, which is much deeper than what I, I just ran you through, but it's a divergent way of thinking that no one has ever come up with. And I am, you know, hey, I'm just a girl that grew up on a farm in central Pennsylvania. I've had some extraordinary opportunities, but I've had opportunities because I'm paying attention and I have opportunities because I force myself to think through business models and to, to take a standard and prescribed way of thinking break it apart like a jigsaw puzzle and reassemble it in a way that makes sense for the future, not that makes sense just for today. And that's where you have to all get your thinking, retool your thoughts. Whenever you see something in front of you, whenever you see a business in front of you, no matter how successful it is, whether you're connected to it or not, research businesses online, look at them, look at what makes them successful, what makes them, where are their challenges, where are their disruptions, and then start to think through models of how they can do it differently. And I'll give you one example. Um, during COVID, the lady that does my hair, um, that colors it to make sure that I'm not gray, um, you know, every place had to close down during COVID. If you were a hair salon, you couldn't do any business. And, and she said to me, Larissa, I just don't know how we're gonna stay open because we have 10 employees and there's no income coming in for any of them. And, and I am afraid that we're going to have to close our doors. And I said, okay, well, let's think about this. What can you do that will allow you to be able to still add value to your customers, but without having to actually touch their hair or having them in a chair? And she's like, well, I don't know, because, you know, being a, um, a beautician means that I have to be able to physically touch their hair. And I said to her, well, look at me, I'm getting roots because I can't come and see you. And you have a solution that I need in that you have hair color that I need for my hair. And I'll bet you that there are 50 other women out there that come to your salon that would give anything to be able to touch up their roots right now. And they can't. So I said to her, why don't you put a care package together of our color, everything that we need, we can stop and pick it up outside the door. We will pay a premium for it. And on a Friday night over Zoom, Let's have this girls night out where everybody gathers in front and you walk us through what to do to color our roots. It was a business changer for her. She was creating these at-home baskets. She was walking everyone through the process on Zoom. People were enjoying it because they had that camaraderie, that togetherness that we couldn't have during COVID. So people were laughing. They were having cocktail hours together. I would love to see what happened to their hair after cocktail hour. But anyway, um, you know, it was an interesting way forward for them to be able to stay in business, but it all dependent on, depended on being able to think your strategy backwards, um, reverse engineer your strategy, find ways that exist within your business model that you can do it differently to make yourself relevant in a, in a very transformational world. Um, Business is built on a foundation of disruption. So have the courage to cultivate a mindset of disruption. And, you know, that, like I said before, is the difference between you building a corner store or you building Amazon. Giving back is a fundamental pillar of make giving back a fundamental pillar of your business model from day one. If you weave in um, a CSR strategy, a give back strategy, recognizing that your business is only as strong as the community that you support, you won't feel it. If you prioritize, let's say 3% of your revenue to go into a give back model where you are giving a scholarship to the community or you are donating to a nonprofit, you won't feel it. If you say, oh, I need every bit of my capital to be going into building this company, I'll deal with the give back down the road when the business is up and running. 
I can promise you that it's going to hurt when you have to take 3% out and pledge that as a give back. And you're most likely not going to want to do it. So if you make giving back a fundamental pillar of your business model from day one, you will differentiate yourself in that very crowded marketplace from all of your competitors, because you will become a value add to your community, not just to your customers. And businesses who prioritize giving back to the community outperform businesses that don't. Create a culture of giving in your workplace. Make it something that, that feels good to everyone. So when you as a company give, create a campaign that allows your employees to feel a sense of pride from that give back. Reward your employees for volunteering. Create um, a payroll deduction program in your workplace where you allow employees to pledge a small portion of their paycheck, which is automatically deducted to a nonprofit of their choice. You know, it creates a culture of giving and a culture of giving in a workplace makes a much more sustainable workplace. There's lower turnover rates. There's a better sense of team. And overall, that's a company that will be strong and, and able to weather any of the storms that come in front of them. And therefore, they will be a company that weathers those storms with success. Embrace the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you don't know what the UN SDGs are, Google it. You're going to see a very colorful chart that outlines 17 of the most important goals for the survival of our planet the survival of our societies, and the survival of our global economics. Just pick one of those SDG goals to make an impact, and you will make a, a massive impact on mankind. You know, some people try to impact all 17, and that's the wrong way to approach it because your, your impact will be token. But if you as a young business owner, a small business owner, as you, if you as a human being pick one of those 17 SDGs to make an impact to, you will make a measurable impact on, on the future. Giving back, giving back will give you valuable perspective, allowing you to disrupt the legacy business model. And why I say that is that when you give back, suddenly new doors open up to you. New opportunities come to you. New customers come to you. New, you know, new perspective around your supply chain. You'll want to have a conscience for your supply chain. You'll, you'll trace it all the way back to the beginning so that you know every aspect of your supply chain. You'll want to know that you're making a difference. If you, are, if you have a chocolate company and you are buying milk, know the family farm that you're supporting and put that out there for your customers so that they know that you support a family farm or that um, somewhere in your supply chain, you have a woman owned business or there's a family owned business. Make sure that you tell your customers that story because that's valuable not only for you as a business to, create, to differentiate yourself from your consumers, but it gives your consumers, your customers, your stakeholders, your employees, it allows them to have the reciprocal value of your business conscience. And they're more likely to even pay more to do business with you than they would be to go to a lesser priced competitor. For me, giving back has been an important part of, of everything I do. When I worked for the Royal Family, our priority was to provide the tools and resources necessary for young people and women in refugee camps to turn themselves into entrepreneurs. There were some phenomenal innovations that came out of some of these refugee camps. There was a young, a young boy, 12 years old in, in Iraq, who recognized the power of the internet and created a, a very successful business for himself by teaching people Arabic. So he would charge and then get on line with people and he would teach them Arabic um, firsthand, almost in an immersive um, manner. And, and people would do that. They wanted to support somebody that was in, in a struggling situation or that was displaced and they got the value out of it, of, of being able to, to learn a language. But there's so many opportunities for entrepreneurship. Um, when I was at this particular refugee camp in Mosul, there was a center for, for women where they had sewing machines so they could um, sew clothes and, and um, create opportunities for themselves there. And all of the sewing machines were quiet. And it's because all of the organizations around the world donate clothes and shoes and coats instead of thread and fabric, which would then allow those women to turn themselves into social entrepreneurs. So I always urge people when you make your contributions, think about it from the perspective of, of what value can this create 
on, on the entrepreneurial side for the recipient. Um, if we give them their clothes, then there's no market for women who could potentially make the clothes and sell them. So, you know, entrepreneurship exists fundamentally in all countries, in all cultures, in all walks of life. And we have a responsibility as entrepreneurs to support other entrepreneurs, regardless of where they are around the globe. Um, I've been to Iraq, I've been to Yemen, Jordan, Somalia, um, and refugee camps, you know, young people who have so much talent and innovation trapped in their minds, you know, that's a priority of mine. So I don't just focus on building my business here, but I always look at how can I take somebody who may never have opportunity, even somebody here in the United States, somebody who's never had access to opportunity, and how can I put them on a pathway that could potentially change their lives through entrepreneurship? The business model of tomorrow and today means that we have to disrupt, we have to innovate, we have to have environmental and so social and governance practices in place that allow us to be one of those vanguard businesses that allow us to lead the way forward into the future. We have to recognize that technology will be the epicenter of every single business and industry, regardless whether it's education, whether it's financial, whether it's agricultural, whether it's whether it's transportation, technology is the nucleus of every single industry and sector, and data is the new oil. We have to collect data. We have to understand how to use the data. We have to understand how to monetize data because data is what's going to help you as you shape your business models and strategies for the future. And collaboration, yes, even competitive collaboration is important for your business mindset, for your business model, because together we're stronger and you must have a global mindset. Our business community, as I said, is no longer the proximity of where we live. It's the entire globe. So with that, I would love if you see my, um, my e well, my email address should be at the bottom, but it's cut off, but I'll make sure that, that you all have that. Please feel free, any of you to reach out to me at any time. Um, yes, I'm busy, but I'm never too busy to to guide and mentor and, and hopefully help young entrepreneurs as you begin this journey. Um, if any of you have any questions for me today, I'd be very happy to answer them. And um, let me see if I can get my, my camera back on here. Um, I'll stop my share. Start my video again. And Tyler, I don't know it is, if you have um, wanna lead the question and answers, I'd love to be able to answer some questions if anybody has them. And I just am really sad and sorry that I'm not standing in front of you in that room. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. We are out of time today. So we will uh, we'll do the, the Q&A uh, offline uh, via email. So thank you once again for joining us today. My pleasure.